Thanks, Ruth. Good morning. Uh, this is an incredible spot. Um, feel pretty blessed this morning. Um, there are a couple seats still left on the swings. <laughs> if a few of you would uh, like to go that direction. So um, if you need assistance, we can help you do that too. Um, yeah, this is, this is, gentlemen, this is our morning, I think, maybe our day, uh, where, where we are uh, celebrated wholehearty and uh, got texts and, uh, you know, happy Father's Day from all of our children. I think I'm 66% of mine have said happy Father's Day. <laughs> so we'll see who all eats lunch. <laughs> the oldest one is the one who hasn't quite got there that's okay she's planning big things for later i think so i'll just keep and wait for my surprise no this is one of those mornings uh one of those days where we we celebrate a certain segment uh, of society um and and we acknowledge that it's not just fathers that we say happy father's day to but it's grandfathers of course um it's uncles if you're an uncle I know uncles have that uh, free reign to cause a ruckus. Um, that's one of your roles as an uncle, but also to do some fair amount of fathering uh, as well. So that blessing of being able to speak truth and life and love into nieces and nephews, what an incredible opportunity. Uh, if you're an older brother, uh, if you have younger siblings, you've done a little bit of fathering, a little bit of training there. Um, as life has gone on, uh, if you are, if you've been a part of church, you've been a part of leadership teams, been a part of uh, working in a, in a place, you've done some fathering if you're a, if you're a man. <laughs> yeah, we thought we moved away from the sound of the road and now we have, we're in the flight pattern of somewhere. <laughs> Um, I had to think about, you know, the roles of what a father does, um, the opportunity that, that uh, is kind of unique to, to dads, um, and mothers do quite a bit of it too, but, you know, fathers get to, uh, one of the things fathers seem, at least in our household, I speak from my, my own perspective, of course, you know, fathers get to be the one to, uh, who fixes things often, when you need that uh, uh, brute force brute strength when mom says get dad will get that um oftentimes when it comes to a toilet that's so too so we get to do those things of uh 
solving the problem. That's in that they get to on that boom fire uh, to bring correction. Um, uh, we try not to do it too often, but we, we, we get to do that. Um, when we speak, sometimes they listen. So <laughs> that's good. Um, fathers have that ability to be, to be strong, but also can be tender and caring um, for children to come and to jump in your lap and to feel secure. Uh, what an incredible opportunity uh, to talk to a, an older gentleman or an older man, an uncle um, or a grandparent, and to be able to listen to their wisdom and their experience. What a unique um, place to be and what an opportunity to serve as a, as a father and as an uncle or grandparent. You know, we also, also have to acknowledge that, you know, all of our stories of our fathers are different. And they're not all just hunky-dory. It's not all just perfect. We are definitely, as dads and men, um, you know, fallible and make mistakes and wish we could take things back. Some of our relationships, some of us have, have lost fathers at a young age um, and have to, have to do life um, feeling sort of fatherless. Some of us have, uh, have been distant from our fathers, whether physically or even just emotionally. Um, and that's, that's tough. That, uh, there's a lot to wrestle with. And so we acknowledge that, that it's not just um, happy Father's Day and everything's perfect. Um, so we come to this morning um, celebrating and thinking about those things, but also uh, thinking about fathers and and the, the harshness and hardness of that relationship sometimes, and the, uh, the joy and the kindness. And then we also, you know, we come here to gather as um, Jesus followers or those on the journey toward God and, and experiencing what it means to be a part of his family, that we all have had the opportunity, whether our fathers were available or not, we have that opportunity to be grafted into this, father, this, this new family of God to be adopted in to this family. I had to think as I read through the Old Testament, um, you know, you can tell a lot by, you jump into this new family, you can tell a lot what a father is like based on how he treats his other children. And so we read these stories of, of God's children messing up and being just absolutely terrors. They are terrors. And yes, God corrects. He's a good God and he does what he needs to do and he does what he says he'll do and he corrects them, but also he just relentlessly pursues them. No matter how far they run, no matter how much junk they get into, he just continues to go back and seek them and search for them and call them back. Jeremiah and Isaiah speak words that God just says, if you, if you just turn to me, I'm here. I'm here. All you have to do, my love is just waiting to be poured out on you. I am here. What an incredible, incredible father that we can rest in and find peace and hope and to find joy, goodness. To, uh, not that we can push aside all the hard stuff of life, but that we can, uh, we can trust in a father who is there, who will be there, who has been there, um, and that we can find hope in life. So on this Father's Day, we recognize the, the father of us all, and we rest and put our hope in that father, and we think about our fathers on earth here and how we are as fathers and uncles and um, manly leaders in our community and what we do different and our opportunity to do different. Um, but we rest in that peace. As we talk about, as Mel shares today about some of the hangups and some of the mess ups of, of these men in the scriptures. Um, we think about those things and holding those two things in tension of whew, lots of messes, but also lots of joy and trying and grace 
and where that all comes together and where we find God there constant, full of love and full of peace. So God, we come to this time, this hour together. We rest in this beautiful sanctuary. God, we listen to your creation. We feel the mugginess of the morning as it turns more and more muggy. The amazing creation that you've made for us. So we recognize your spirit in this place. The movement of the trees. The presence of other believers, of other children. And God, we say, happy Father's Day to you. Thanks for accepting us with all our warts and scars and mishaps, all of our stupidity, that you just want to be with us. So God, here we are. We give you this hour to focus our attention to you, to turn our hearts and our minds and our souls, our voices and our ears toward you. Amen. Just by word of uh, explanation, I know your bulletin says that Carmen was going to be playing violin this morning, <clears throat> but no matter how well you plan your days, God sometimes ordains differently. Carmen got up this morning with severe nausea, vomiting, fever, is laying at home on the bathroom floor to be close to the facilities. <laughs> um, so we're very disappointed that she isn't able to be here to play for you this morning on her violin. We had looked forward to it probably as much as anybody. <laughs> so just wanted to explain why she isn't here. And you could say a prayer for her. <laughs> the practice last night sounded beautiful with, with a violin, but today is different. The songs we sing this morning all refer to Father or something that Father has created. This is My Father's World and uh, For the Beauty of the Earth is the first two songs here. Both of them talking about beauty and appreciation. And I appreciated the prayer about honoring God for what he has made for us. Uh, that's great. So let's uh, I'll tell you what, a lot of us can stand. Those of you who don't want to, you stay seated, stay comfortable. But those of you that are young and under <laughs> that age yeah stand up <laughs> let's sing this is my father's world this is my father's world and to my listening all nature sings and round me rings the music of the sea. This is my father's world. I rest in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hand the wonders wrought. This is my father's world. The birds their carols praise, the morning light, the lily white, their maker's praise. This is my father's world, he shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass, he sees to me everywhere. This is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one. And the next one, for the beauty of the earth. <laughs> and I had to think there's a lot of beauty in this earth and a lot of things that are here for enjoyment for all ages. As, uh, us adults, you know, we look at the beautiful trees and things like that. And, and when the grandkids come around, them little crayfish get caught and things like that. There's so many things from the little bit 
I'm not talking about the mosquitoes. I am talking about many other things that we can enjoy and let's enjoy them. For the beauty of the earth. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the sky, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the beauty of each hour of the day and of the night, hill and vale and tree and flower, sun and moon and stars of light. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above, for all gentle thoughts and mild. Lord of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. Our scripture today is from Acts chapter 9. We're going to read verses 1 through 6 and 17 to 20. Um, as a quick note, when we were, when I was in high school in concert choir, we sang a song called, I think it was called Saul. Andrew can probably attest to this. It was a little bit of a creepy song. Um, and it was a lot of like chaos and a lot of um, moving parts and things that didn't make any sense until the end when it was powerful. And I think that just really reflects the transition that Saul made in his lifetime and in this story. So we'll go ahead and read that. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he approached Damascus on a mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. He regained his sight and then got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days, and immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is indeed the Son of God. Thank you, Michelle and Jeremy and Roy and Ruth for leading our worship time today. And God has provided us with a beautiful Sunday morning to meet outdoors. I could have brought my notes that I had written for last Sunday, and it would have been very fitting this Sunday, <laughs> but uh, we enjoyed last Sunday, too. But uh, on this Father's Day, we're grateful for this nice weather. A few weeks ago, on Mother's Day, you may remember that I spoke about several examples of women that are found in the Bible. And some of you know that ahead of time, each Sunday, I send out an email with a little synopsis of what the sermon is going to be about. And in that particular week, I had noted in my little synopsis that not all of the women that I would be speaking about 
would be perfect examples of faithful living that we should try to imitate. That email brought a wonderful response with a brief reminder that the men spoken of in the Bible are not all perfect either. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? <laughs> so on this day, when we honor our earthly fathers, maybe it would seem a bit unnecessary, but it's only fair to remind ourselves that while our fathers may well be heroes at times, as humans, and particularly humans of the male gender, a lot of men, including fathers, can also be real jerks sometimes. So while I titled the message for this morning, Heroes or Jerks, <laughs> truth is, we may see a little bit of both in the examples that we look at from scripture, just as we see in real life, and perhaps we sometimes see in ourselves. Many of you know about Facebook. It's an app that some of us use on our computers or our cell phones pretty regularly. And it does have its downside, but every once in a while, there's some real true wisdom that shows up on Facebook. This past week, Jess King posted a note about her two boys, Everett and Elijah, trying to play a guessing game. And big brother was getting a bit frustrated with little brother not playing the game right. Mm -hmm. So mom steps in to explain to big brother that some extra patience might be needed because the other brother is little and doesn't fully understand how the game works. As mom returns to her work, she hears big brother's voice rising once again, and then little brother's plaintive response, I'm widow, remember? I'm widow. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> there were two comments from other adults that were added to that posting by the time I saw it. One of those comments said, well, sometimes I'm widow too when I'm trying to learn something. <laughs> and the other comment simply said, yeah, we're all widow sometimes. <laughs> yeah, that's the truth, isn't it? So this man that we heard about in our scripture text still had a lot to learn before he could become the Apostle Paul, one of the New Testament heroes of the faith. But before we get to that story, there's a couple of others that I want to to look at too. And one is the story of Noah, that man of such great faith that when God instructed him to build a boat because there was a huge flood coming, Noah built that boat, even though at the time he had never seen rain before. As a good father, Noah took his wife and their three sons and their wives with him on the boat, along with all the other animals. Their lives were all spared when the rains did begin, and the earth was covered with water. A real hero, this man Noah, right? Except there's a bit more to his story that we find in Scripture. You won't find it in very many children's Bible story books. But after the flood, when the family is safely on dry ground again, we find in Genesis chapter 10 that Noah planted a vineyard made wine from the fruit, liked it so much that he promptly got drunk. And Ham, his youngest son, according to what's written there, discovered Noah lying in his tent with no pants on. Ham went and told his two older brothers, and they respectfully covered up his, their father while walking backwards so they wouldn't have to look at him. Story ended, right? But no, when Noah found out later what had happened, he got very angry with Ham for seeing him naked. And Noah pronounced a curse, not only on Ham, but on his son Canaan as well, that they should become the lowest of slaves to his brothers. Some Bible scholars believe this might have been the beginning of separate tribes of people, perhaps even the origin of different races, although that probably is a bit of a stretch. And there probably is more to this story than what we have recorded in scripture. But it would certainly seem like a bit of a blemish on Noah's record as a hero. Although, when you stop to think about it, who of us haven't got upset or angry at something stupid that we have done and then tried to 
pin the blame on someone else who might have been totally innocent just in order to try and ease our conscience and make ourselves feel better. Big time hero, this man Noah, with just a seemingly small lapse in his character, but those effects may have lasted for generations. Fathers and all of us, we need to watch our words and our actions carefully. They do make an impact on the people around us and especially on our children. And those words or actions can take us from being known as a great man of faith to being recognized as simply an ordinary human being with faults just like anybody else. Second story that I've chosen to look at this morning is, is also about a couple of well-known figures in Old Testament history and in this record of God working among his people. Primarily, we're looking at King David. And that's the story of this little shepherd boy who became a king over all of Israel. Wonderful story. We hear about his bravery and fighting against the giant Goliath. His mighty feats of battle as a warrior in King Saul's army. David earned the admiration of many people. He became a real hero in their sight. We perhaps know him best as a man after God's own heart read that in scripture who wasn't perfect but when he was confronted with a terrible sin in his life David was willing to confess his wrongdoing before God and receive forgiveness the history of David's struggles with King Saul as well as his ultimate faith in God show up frequently in the many poems and songs that David wrote we have them today in our Bibles in the book of Psalms but there's a part of David's life that we don't hear a lot about in the Bible. That's his family life. Besides the acknowledgement that he had numerous wives and concubines. There is, however, a story about one of David's sons that is particularly tragic. That son's name is Absalom. Absalom's mother was a foreign princess that David married before he became king. And in 2 Samuel 14, we hear that in all of Israel, there was no one to be praised as much for his beauty as was Absalom. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. <laughs> Does that make anyone here feel just a smidgen of jealousy? <laughs> and speaking of the crown of his head, it was said that Absalom cut his hair once a year and that the hair he cut off weighed 200 shekels by the king's weight. <laughs> scholars argue, argue about exactly how much that would have been but the point being made is that he must have had a remarkably full head of beautiful long hair <laughs> now I'm starting to feel a little envious myself <laughs> <laughs> story gets much more involved but for our purposes this morning we'll just mention that at one point Absalom did something that got him into really big trouble and he fell out of favor with his father David and left home. Later on, David regretted that break in their relationship, and there was an effort to patch things up, but it didn't really go very well. And eventually, Absalom actually led an armed rebellion against his father, trying to overthrow the government and take over the throne. When you consider that, it sounds like our hero, King David, didn't quite measure up in his son's eyes. And then we come to the part of the story that you may be a little more familiar with. When David's army sets out to defend the kingdom against this rebel army. And even though David gives specific instructions not to harm his son Absalom. In the midst of the battle, Absalom is riding his mule through the forest. And his beautiful long hair gets caught in the branches of a tree. And his mule rides on without him, and he's left hanging there by his hair. And one of David's soldiers discovers him, and he is killed and buried under a pile of stones out in the forest. In a strictly political sense, it was a great victory it had been won that day, but it doesn't feel like a victory for King David. 
who when he hears the news, covers his face and weeps with a loud voice. Oh, my son Absalom, I wish that I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son. Now that's kind of a sad story to be talking about on Father's Day, isn't it? But for me, this account points to a number of characteristics that I think are characteristics about fathers in general. And maybe you'll rec recognize some of them in yourself if you are a father, or perhaps as you think about your father today. And among them would be that a father's love is never conditioned on his children's behavior. Yeah, the children's version of Absalom's story is that he was so proud of his looks and this was that pride that led to the conflict with his father and his untimely death. But as always, relationships between parents and children are never quite that simple. Absalom's life was a mixture of good conduct and outright rebellion. And even when David might have rightfully feared for his life during the attempted coup, his love for his son never stopped. He would have willingly given his life rather than for Absalom to suffer and die. And yet, despite that love, there was a time in Absalom's life when David was so offended by his actions that he cut ties with his son to the extent we read that they didn't see each other for over two years before they made that attempt at reconciliation. And maybe that reunion helped to relieve the tension between father and son, but it's immediately after that when the text begins to describe Absalom's campaign to sway the hearts of the people away from his father and to gain their loyalty in order to take over the throne. You have to wonder if there could have possibly been another outcome. And yet, if David was not always the hero figure in this father-son relationship, it's clear that the blame did not all rest on him. Fathers must accept some responsibility for the character of their children. They have a responsibility to set a good example and to teach moral values. But fathers cannot carry all the responsibility for the character of their children. There are so many other influences that enter every person's life. And every person is also a free moral agent. We all make our own choices in life. I believe there are some fathers who are carrying a load of guilt that they really do not need to carry. The fact that we are not always a hero doesn't necessarily mean that we're a jerk or vice versa. In our text from Acts, Saul appears, at least to us, in the beginning as a real jerk breathing threats and murder against the disciples of Jesus. Not satisfied with persecuting the Christians living in Jerusalem, Saul asks for letters of authority to take with him to the Damascus synagogues so that if he found any people there who were followers of the Jesus way, he could arrest them and bring them back to Jerusalem for trial and punishment. And we should note, that Saul did not consider that what he was doing was bad. In fact, he believed it was the right thing to do. He thought he was pleasing God by what he was doing. In a sense, we could say he was just yittle in his lack of understanding of what God was up to. And God, in his grace and mercy, determined to give Saul another chance. Actually, it was a, a really scary lesson in who God is and in who Saul is. Jesus himself, appearing to Saul as he traveled on that road to Damascus, speaking to him in no uncertain terms that what Saul has been doing is not just persecuting Christians, but persecuting Jesus, God's own son. What kind of a jerk would even think about doing something like that? Well, to be honest, we might all have to raise our hands and say, yeah, sometimes we've been that kind of a jerk too. But Saul's not left to wallow in his guilt. Instead, he is given instructions for how to move toward a change of heart and mind. 
Go on into Damascus and you'll be told what you should do. So here's the first choice that Saul has to make. We don't read about this in the, in the verses, but it seems pretty obvious. He had to decide, will he willingly admit that he was wrong? That he had been spending the last days and weeks and months of his life doing things that were not pleasing to God? Could he accept that? Could he actually decide, yes, I have been doing the wrong thing? Would he follow those instructions? Go on into the city and wait to see what God had in mind for him? Or would he cut and run for home and go back to his old familiar life and ways? That blazing light that stopped him on the road made him temporarily blind in his eyes. So we might think he really didn't have any choice, but he did. For three days, Saul has time to consider what has actually been happening to him. Or did it really happen? I can imagine the devil trying to put doubts in Saul's mind. Uh, you just, just imagined what happened out there on the road. Maybe you were struck by a bolt of lightning. You just, your mind is all messed up. You're just not thinking clear. You're blind. You're confused. Nothing's happened here. Why don't you just go on home? And it's not just Saul who is questioning what God is doing here. The second character in our text, named Ananias, is also wondering, God, why are you telling me to actually go to this man from Jerusalem? We know what a jerk that he's been, the hurt that he has caused to so many people and to the church. But God insists, go, Ananias, I have chosen this man to serve as my representative before the Gentiles, before even kings, as well as to the people of Israel. So Ananias goes, as he was told, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, Saul is healed from his blindness. Saul's life and heart are completely changed. How many people over the years have found fault with the newly baptized Saul, who becomes Paul, saying that his letters to the early church reveal something of a bit of pride in his spirit yet, arguing that Paul claimed too much authority in his insistence on freedom from the law, or on the flip side, that he was too authoritative in his teaching about Christian life. But what is clear is that Paul did exactly what God said he was called to do. He traveled to places few other Christians of his day would go. This man who had persecuted believers became one of the persecuted. He was hauled into court. He testified before magistrates and yes, even before kings. Living out as well as witnessing to the truth that he had met Jesus personally and that of a certainty Jesus is the son of God. Both Paul and Ananias can serve as examples for us this morning, for fathers included. Ananias as a model of listening to God and being obedient, even at great personal risk of, to his life and his reputation. He didn't really know what was going to happen when he went in to meet with Paul. And Saul, whose story gives us all hope, that God can take even a jerk and transfer, transform them into a useful tool in God's kingdom. Now, Paul's life wasn't perfect after his conversion on the road to Damascus that day. But we owe a lot to his faithful life and testimony. Just as we also owe a debt of gratitude to the fathers and the father figures in our life who have shown us the love of God, and who have helped us to grow in our own faith. As Jeremy mentioned, not everyone has been blessed to have that positive example for an earthly father. So if you have been blessed in that way, you can be truly thankful today. And fathers, we do want to celebrate you on this Father's Day, but I also want to challenge you to keep the big picture in mind. Don't ever let an immediate situation of frustration or anger cause you to say things that will damage the relationship you have with your children. 
And if you make a mistake, admit it. Deal with the consequences in an humble spirit. Don't blame yourself for all the choices and decisions your children will make. Just keep on walking beside them, letting them know that you love them. That's what our Father in Heaven does for us too. And that's what will ultimately determine whether you are a hero, even if you occasionally still act like a jerk. Because thankfully, God is still in the business of taking people who are less than perfect and using them to be a positive influence in the world. People just like you and just like me. Let's pray. Thank you, God. You are our great and wonderful Father in heaven. You treat us with the love and care that we don't really deserve as your children. And we continually mess up, do those things that are not what you would desire for us, but you keep coming to us, opening your arms, welcoming us back. Thank you, God. Thank you for the fathers among us today, for the gift that they can be to families, and to even people who are not in their blood family. We're grateful for the many people who have been in those positions for us throughout our life. God, I trust that you will give grace and strength and courage, patience, and all those things that are needed in order to be good fathers and to be the kind of parents that will lead our children into your knowledge and into your presence. Thank you, God. And thank you for this time together this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.